Hey guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get, let's face it, the world's coolest people to talk about the past, the future, and much more. Today we've got somebody who's doing a little bit of all of that on the program, Jack Horner, and he is one of the inspirations for the Jurassic Park series, which of course we're going to have to get into and I'm sure you've talked about, but thanks for coming today, Jack. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) I was listening to an old interview you had and you said something to the effect of, Spielberg told me he didn't want monsters. But we had to keep fighting because, well, he actually wanted monsters. What was it like working on Jurassic Park and being kind of one of the inspirations behind, I got to imagine, a lot of people that got into paleontology and genetic engineering in the past 20 or so years did so because of that film. What's it like being involved with that? And what was it like doing it? Well, it was, you know, it was a lot of fun. Um, It was, it was fun working on a movie. Um. At least in the beginning, I, you know, I come to I come to realize that movies really are pretty boring, and I wouldn't trade my job for their job for anything in this world. Um, but but it was interesting to work with Spielberg. Um, he he would he I I sat right next to him during production, and he would ask questions, and I would try to answer them, um, and it became pretty clear that. You know, that he was going to make his movie. Um, why I was there was <laughs> became more and more of a question uh, because he, you know, he he really wasn't willing. He, you know, he was willing to put a little science in it, but he didn't want any science to, you know, overtake his story. Yeah, you can't you can't hold back the story, and that's the hard part, especially. I think sci-fi is a great example of how people can think about the future without having to live the consequences and possibly avoid it. And I know that, uh, I mean, Jurassic Park, most movies are kind of, are kind of like that. How do you think about that? Because on one hand we have this fake news problem where people are spewing off left and right about, let's face it, just absolutely no science. And then we have scientists who don't really, they don't do a great job of communicating. What is that happy medium between the public and science? Well, that's, that's actually a very good question. Um, I remember when, when I was younger, uh, when I first started college, um, it, it was, you know, it was, people really looked down on you. If you, if you actually gave public lectures, you know, you're, the whole idea was, you know, us scientists were supposed to just basically talk to each other and, and any popularization, and this was, you know, back in the seventies, so uh, any popularization of the science was, you know, you're kind of got a bad reputation if you, if you, if you actually tried to educate the public and yet people at that time were complaining about the, you know, the education system and, and how, you know, teachers, uh, really, um, you know, weren't teaching the kind of science that scientists wanted. <laughs> so it, it was, you can't be, a, you can't be a sellout and you can't do nothing <laughs> else. It's, um, it's, it's crazy. What, a, it, it, you know, it was really something. What got you into dinosaurs, into history so much? There's got to be a story there. I, you know, I was born this way. Um, as far back as I can remember, I, well, I started, I collected my first fossils, not dinosaurs, but some um, clams that were dinosaur age uh, in my backyard when I was four years old, but just, uh, just turning five. And, and then my father, uh, realized that I was very interested in dinosaurs and things like that. And he was kind of a geologist, so he knew a lot about things like that. And so when I was eight years old, he took me to a place where I found my first dinosaur bone. Really? That's cool. That was, that was pretty fun. And then, and I, I lived in, you know, in Montana, I was born and raised in a place in Montana where I wasn't very far from where a lot of famous dinosaurs had been found. And so as my interest continued, my, my mother would drive me to some sites and my father 
um, was, you know, thought it was interesting that I liked geology and things like that. Um, so I found my first dinosaur skeleton when I was 13 and wow. just, uh, and then when I was in high school, I made a science project about dinosaurs and, and, and recently published that. <laughs> so I don't know. I've just, I've, I was just born this way. Recently published that. Why'd you publish it? <laughs> well, it was a interesting, it was a, an interesting question that I had when I was in high school. I was really curious in Montana. We had a lot of, uh, there was a rock unit that had a lot of dinosaur fragments in it. A lot of, a lot of stuff, but no skeletons. And the and what was called the same rock unit in Canada, just across the border, had beautiful skeletons in it. And it was it was curious to me why they were so different, why the same rock unit had had beautiful skeletons, you know, a hundred miles away in Canada, and in Montana, they were all broken up and fragmented and stuff like that. I mean it. It turns out to be a you know simple answer as it's just it act in what it turned out to be we're looking at different points in time geologically so back in those days people didn't they didn't have a lot of resolution in the in the geologic formations and as we learn more and more about them our resolution got better and better and we realized that just you know. The dinos those dinosaurs didn't live at the same time. How, let's talk a little bit more about that resolution. So how do we do geodating currently, and how accurate is it? I, I know like a lot of people, they're kind of, oh, this has been carbon uh, <laughs> carbon dated to X, Y, Z, but no one has any idea how that works. Well, it's it, yeah, so it's not carbon dated. Um, it's radioactive, you know, it's, it's radiometric dating, we'll call it that. And carbon dating is one of the methods of radiometric dating, but there's a whole bunch of them. And basically, it's it's based on on the half life of of radioactive elements. So we all know uranium is is a, a radioactive element, and we know that you know we we know that it that it sheds. Um, um, neutrons. I mean, it basically gives off radiation, right? And so, you know, we we know that from that, that's the reason we're afraid of. That's why Chernobyl was a problem. That's why, you know, that's why we're worried about atomic power plants as they shed their their you know they give off radiation, and so that radiation is actually you know a, an element. Losing, you know, losing part of its, you know, it, it, it's actually, it, it's changing from one um, isotope to another, and, and, and we can predict how how fast it, that happens. So, so, as an example, um, carbon. Carbon is a is one of these kinds of elements, and and it sheds its it it gives off radiation. It changes from one isotope to another, and we can predict that time. The hat we call it the half life, and the half life I forget for carbon is just a like a hundred thousand years. So it it we can only date things that are you know within within a hundred thousand years. Right. I, that's not exactly what it, I don't remember it exactly for carbon, but it's something like a hundred thousand years. So if something's 200,000 years old, you're not going to be able to date it with carbon. I got gotcha. you. That makes sense. Okay. I'm... So, so then we have to use a different, a different isotope. And for dinosaurs that are millions of years old, we use for a long time, we used isotopes of potassium and potassium breaks down to argon and so basically when a when a volcano erupt erupted back in the days of the dinosaurs it get it the the 
the volcanic ash had potassium in it, but no argon. All right, so argon is a gas, and so it it wouldn't be it wouldn't be in the volcanic ash. It would have escaped when the volcano erupted if there was any there. But as the sediment as it as it lays down on the ground and then is covered up, that potassium breaks down to argon. It's half life, right? And we know how fast that happens. And so, so we if we you know, are digging up dinosaurs and we have a sample of volcanic ash, which we have lots of in those in the dinosaur days. There were a lot of volcanoes going off. We just take a piece we just take a basically take a piece of volcanic ash and measure the amount of potassium and the amount of argon. And we have a pretty good idea within you know, within a 150, 200,000 years of how old it is. And when we're talking about something that's 65 or 70 million years ago, you know, 200,000 years is close enough. And the dinosaurs were around for a really long time. They were essentially perfectly evolved for the world that they found themselves in. Well, you know, nothing's, you know, the perfectly evolved thing is, you know, that that's a, completely subjective as you can probably imagine we like to think we are pub, you know perfectly evolved and yet we can't we can't run very fast and our eyes don't work very well and you know lots of animals can see more of the spectrum than we can and we don't hear very well and mcdonald's <laughs> you know where is nothing you know evolution is 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 certainly about it's always trying, you know, it's, it's, we're always selecting for the, for perfection in the ecosystem we're in, but the ecosystem keeps changing. So, so we're never really perfect. Nothing's ever really perfect. Is it silly to use a categorization like dinosaurs when there really were so many different types? Is that kind of like saying primates or what, what would be an analogous way to think about that? Well, yeah, dinosaur, dinosaur, the term dinosaur is a huge category right now. You know, for for many years, we thought that dinosaurs uh, were big, stupid, green thing, cold-blooded reptiles that wandered around looking for a place to go extinct. And and then we realized, uh, you know, after the work of John Ostrom at Yale University, we realized that birds were actually the descendants of dinosaurs. And nowadays, you know, we actually classify birds as a group of dinosaurs. And so, and so, you know, dinosauria actually includes all of the ones that went extinct, the ones we call non-avian dinosaurs, and the ones that are still alive that we call avian dinosaurs. So, you know, when it comes to perfection or comes to success, the dinosaurs, you know, that we oftentimes use as kind of the symbol of of failure are actually the most successful group of vertebrate animals ever. And in terms of the avian, non-avian, this is the whole, do we put feathers on the velociraptor debate? We definitely put feathers on the velociraptor, yes. We know... We know for sure that Velociraptor had feathers. So is the difference between the two primarily feathers, no feathers, in terms of how a lay person would think about it, like a T-Rex? T-Rex probably had some feathers on it, yes. It was a big animal, and you know, it, feathers probably evolved to, to insulate, and so, so a big animal size of T-Rex living in a and in you know a relatively warm environment isn't going to require insulation so i would i would venture to guess that the juveniles probably had more feathers than the full grown adults did but when we think about dinosaurs the meat eating dinosaurs definitely had feathers and the plant eating dinosaurs probably had some kind of Featheration. In other words, they may have had display features that were made of of um, the kind of keratin that we see in feathers. Um, we 
we call, it's called beta keratin. Oh, beta keratin. Why, why the meat eaters definitely and the plant eaters probably? Well, because, um, uh, the fossil, we have found fossils of a lot of different kinds of theropod dinosaurs and the theropod dinosaurs are the meat eaters. And, um, all of the little theropods that we've been finding, a lot of the little theropod dinosaurs found in China are all feathered. And more recently there was, a uh, one of the ostrich like dinosaurs. Do you remember Jurassic Park? There was a whole herd of uh, these ostrich like dinosaurs. The evil right? emus, right? Pardon? The evil emus with the massive claws. Well, they uh, I don't remember what I don't remember what they called them, but anyway, they, they look they look like ostriches running along. Anyway, they they have been found recently with feathers as well. So so we know the little velociraptors had feathers. We know that the ostrich-like dinosaurs had feathers, and we found evidence of uh, featheration in some of the larger um, meat-eating dinosaurs. So we, you know, when individuals of different groups of dinosaurs have feathers, it suggests that they all, all of the meat-eating dinosaurs probably had them. Makes sense. Just like birds, you know. I mean. You know, if you found five or six versions of birds, you would assume all birds had feathers. Makes sense. Most primates have some type of hair or fur. We all have all, more things in common. All, all mammals. Mammals. Not just primates. That, all mammals. That's that's actually what I meant. Good point. Good point. So what's it like being an archaeologist? Tell me about going out to dig. I, stuff. I yeah, tell me about being not, busy. Archaeologist. Not archaeologist, paleontologist. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I am definitely not an archaeologist. Ever think about it? What? Doing archaeology? No, no, I don't. I, you know, I try to stay away from, I do my best to stay away from anything that, that is highly political or highly religious. And us humans, we're both. So archaeology has to do with human human remains and quite frankly, you know, we've got enough of us already and and so I like working on animals that we we really don't have anymore. I like to work on the extinct ones. I hear you're trying to bring uh, trying to bring some of those guys back. Yes. <laughs> that didn't learn from a uh... Yeah, you're supposed to be Dr. Alan Grant, right? Isn't that uh, isn't that the story? <laughs> That's the story. But you know, fortunately, the world doesn't work like it does in movies. You know, all of Steven Spielberg's animals that he's ever made in a movie go after people, and we know that you know we could just as easily we could, you know, we we don't have to worry about. Sharks trying to eat a boat in order to eat a person. And and we know that animals aren't going to break into your, you know, tear your car apart just to eat a person when they have perfectly good triceratops laying out in the field. Yeah, sharks will literally avoid you because you're not fat enough for it to be worth the bite. Pro probably. But I know for sure they're not going to eat a boat just to get to a person. So... <laughs> Tell me, tell me a little bit more about what we knew about dinosaurs that people don't know or don't understand. What kind of intelligence was there that we can tell of? What kind of social structures? A lot of this stuff, I, I'm going to be honest, most people only really know from either A, reading a book, B, watching like The Land Before Time, or C, probably the most probable is Jurassic Park. I agree. that That is definitely where most people get their dinosaur information. And, and it, you know, Probably the the worst part of that is that the Jurassic Park story, um, you know, began in 1993, and and the the theme runs through all of all five movies. So the dinos, you know, the dinosaurs that that were that we, you know, that was that were imagined in the first movie. So they were brought back. We know what their DNA was like. I mean, if you just if you put yourself into that story, you realize that from '93 until last year, when the last movie came out, 
those dinosaurs actually, we couldn't change them because they're all part of one story. So we couldn't put feathers on them in between somewhere. We'd, we'd have to explain how, why all of a sudden, why the, why the ones in 1993 didn't have feathers. So, so unfortunately, you know, the dinosaurs of Jurassic World, the Fallen Kingdom, even though we know that dinosaurs were completely different than what we see in that movie, had to remain the same because of the storyline of Jurassic Park. So, so we got to kill the franchise to do it right. We've got to fill the yeah. We got to kill the franchise or definitely make some alterations to it in order to see what dinosaurs, what we think dinosaurs look like now. And quite frankly, what they would look like is what we actually knew they should look like back in '93. Um, we knew that we knew then that that the Velociraptor should have feathers, and we also knew that they should be colorful. And so, you know, we've learned what basically what we've learned in the last, you know, 30 years is, is that, is that dinosaur, that's that the theropod dinosaurs were all feathered and that they would have been much more colorful like birds. I mean, vividly colored like birds. And so, you know, that even Stephen in 1993, when I, I told him, I said, you know, we should have. These dinosaurs should be feathered and they should be colorful. And he said, and I quote, technicolor dinosaurs, feathered technicolor dinosaurs. So. Well, can you he, say that part one more time? It cut out. Sorry. Uh, he, he said, he said, feathered technicolor dinosaurs are not scary enough. It's uh, I mean, imagine the carnivorously evil uh, peacock. It's uh, yeah, it's yeah, ironic. I mean, yeah, it is ironic. I feel like you could probably do something with that though, because it would kind of be like imagine the puppy where you've got him and he's nice and cute, and then he hops on your bed and slits your throat. That's kind of terrifying in a serial killer type of way. That if is. You have that if you have the cuteness factor contraposed with uh, that that the inner inner demon, so to speak. So yeah, and, and interestingly enough, you know, we know uh, from finding a lot of baby dinosaurs, we know that they were actually cute. They would have been cute. I mean, they they have big eyes, and I mean, they have all of the 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 features of the skull that we see in in you know in 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 little chicks, you know, um, chicken chicken chicks, and and you know, and and other birds. So so there's a so there really is sort of a cute factor there. Do we have any idea in terms of intelligence? I've heard all sorts of numbers, but I've also can tell from what I've seen and heard that a lot of it's rubbish. Well, so yeah, there there's it's that's still a big point of contention as far as intel, you know, the intelligence of dinosaurs. Their cranial brain is is not very big. Um, our cranial brain, you know, is huge compared so brain to body ratio if you're going to look at it like we look at it for ourselves our brain to body ratio is very high and if we look at at most birds the brain to body ratio is pretty low and so you know that's why we have the term bird brain you know and that's not a compliment right and yet we have parrots and they're and you know a lot and crows which are actually pretty smart right so and their brain to body ratio still isn't much different than than the ones we call bird brains so so it's pretty clear that you know we don't really know what it is um size is size is some kind of a factor but it's clearly not all of the factors and we don't really know what all of the factors might be. Now, another, an interesting thing about dinosaurs, and it's people have known about it for a long time, the, the suggestion that they have a second brain in their pelvis. And there's definitely an enlarged ganglion or a lar an enlarged part of the spinal cord um, that, that actually could have taken 
that could have operated as a lot of the motor functions, the hind legs and tail and so forth, um, could have been controlled in a different place. Like front, we, like a front and wheel, front and back drive for your yeah, wheels. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you know, we're we're very mammal centric us humans. We we think everything should be in one place, and and so there's a lot of a lot of you know a lot of people who you know as soon as you say something like that, they're like, no, oh, that's just ridiculous. But we don't know. We don't know enough about our own brain to know to be speculating about you know, an animal that we don't know at all. So octopuses have 10 or eight brains, don't they? One in each part of their arm or something to thereabouts. Well, they certainly have, it, it's different than us, us for sure. But like I say, it's, you know, a lot of, a lot of research to be done there. What are the odds you think that we, it seems like with people, especially with animals, we like to write other things off as not human, as not at the same level as us. How much of that is just the? How much of that is just the same thing that, to be honest, Europeans did with slaves, and everyone's done ever yeah. in terms of wanting to be able to look down on others so that they don't, so that it simplifies things for them. Yeah, well, that's that's what it does. That's exactly what it does. And and you know the cool thing about dinosaurs, and this is this is kind of my research these days is centered around the whole notion that dinosaurs had 150 million years to evolve. You know, mammals, mammals, mammals existed at the same time as dinosaurs, but they were, they were, you know, they were all nocturnal. They were tiny little things the size of a mouse. There wasn't much diversity to them. And then after the dinosaurs went extinct, the last 65 million years is when mammals actually diversified and, and we see the diversity we have today. That's 65 million years. Dinosaurs had more than twice that to evolve all kinds of things that we do not know about, right? I mean, we have no idea what they may have been really like they may have been much more intelligent they might have had they might have had structures soft tissue structures that we don't see in their skeletons i mean they, we just have no idea but quite frankly they had tw more than twice as long to evolve different kinds of features than we had and so so i I think, you know, we're being very, very, very conservative when we think about dinosaurs as just, you know, overgrown crocodiles. Well, I think it's a, I think it's also a possible answer to a Fermi paradox question of if evolving intelligence isn't actually helpful unless you reach a certain threshold, then there seems to be pretty good reason to think that you can evolve perfectly without being all that aware. Yeah, well, you know, the, yeah, I, you know. Adaptations um, of different kinds of animals obviously help them in their ecosystem, right, to survive. Some animals run fast. Some animals can hear really well. Um, we all have our adaptations. Ours, ours is our brain, and and you know, hasn't been. It's just said over and over again that we we're not. You know, we haven't been around long enough to determine whether our brain is doing us any good at all. I mean, there's, or you could certainly make an argument that, that it's more detriment than it is helpful. Yeah. If we make it 150 million years, that will be some, <laughs> that will certainly be something. So I'd, I'd say if we just even make it another thousand years, that's going to be quite something every day, right? Every day. So <laughs> Tell me a little bit more about this dino chicken that you're working on. What is the deal? Because it sounds epic, awesome, and terrifying. Well, that's only because you you know you're you're thinking about movies again. So, you know the the idea of of the dino chicken, the chickenosaurus, or whatever you want to call it. The idea really, when I was working on Jurassic Park, I was I was curious. First off, you know. Michael Crichton had an interesting idea, the idea that, that we might potentially be able to find dinosaur DNA in, in insects uh, preserved in amber. And it was an excellent, excellent idea. 
And and so, uh, in 1993, when the movie came out, uh, m- one of my students, Mary Schweitzer, uh, were actually looking for um, we we were looking for DNA in dinosaurs. I mean, we didn't know that we couldn't find it. And quite frankly, people have been looking for dinosaur DNA for decades. And unfortunately, I mean, there's a lot of people who speculate that they have it, but it's not replicable. And so therefore nobody can prove that they have it. So, so, but there's still the potential that it's out there, but you know, the research that we've been doing suggests that, that there might be tiny fragments, but to, at this point we cannot, it can't be replicated and therefore we can't, we, there's no possible way to do anything like they did in Jurassic Park. So, so when I was working on the movie, I thought it was really cool that, you know, it was an interesting story. It would, it, it seemed like it'd be really cool to see if we could, we could actually, you know, bring a dinosaur back somehow. And, and once we realize that there is no, you know, not likely, we're not likely to get DNA. That's not, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying it's, at the, at the moment, it doesn't seem likely that we're going to get it. Um, then, you know, we're challenged by, you know, how would we do it? Well, birds are dinosaurs. We classify them as dinosaurs. They are their direct descendants. Therefore, birds carry some, some degree of, of DNA of their relatives. And, and so the idea was, is to, to actually, you know, go into the genome of, of, birds and see if we couldn't identify some what we call atavistic genes genes that 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 characterized particular features of dinosaurs that have been turned off during the course of evolution from dinosaurs to birds and and uh back in in uh, the late 90s um, some people had been doing research on on uh, on uh, on that on the on atavistic genes, and a guy by the name of Matthew Harris was actually able to to get teeth to to begin to form in a chicken, and so that was you know what we would call proof of concept that there were atavistic genes that could be turned on and that had been turned off and we could turn them back on and, and possibly get some of these ancient characteristics back into a bird. So retro engineering a bird back to a dinosaur like animal. So that's what we, we started doing that. We started looking into that and, and you know, a lot First off, people thought it was a really crazy notion, but then other laboratories started working on it as well. And there was a group at Yale University that was able to alter the the uh, shape of the head of a bird of a of a chicken um, to look more like its its ancestral form. Um, so actually, change the shape of the head. Uh, there's a group in in uh, um, Chile, um, that a lab in Chile, a genetics lab that has been able to alter the foot and the leg of a, of a chicken, of a bird. And, and actually, you know, um, what come out of it is, is basically a leg and, and foot just like a dinosaur. And so, you know, we have, we, we know that these all these atavistic type genes exist in birds, and the matter it's a matter of just finding them now. Basically, we're at a point where, where if all of these turned off genes can be turned on in one animal, we could get an animal right now that that has a 
you know, a dinosaur like head with teeth, um, legs and feet like a dinosaur and actually arms and hands like a dinosaur, not wings. Um, the part we're having a real tar- tough time with is a tail and the tail does not, is not, uh, the result of an atavism. It's not, it's not just something that's turned off. It, it, in order to get a long bony tail like dinosaurs had, we are going to actually have to do some real genetic engineering, probably using something like CRISPR-Cas9, the, the new technology for gene editing. It's, it's incredibly interesting what's possible these days. Are you, are you working at all with George Church's lab? Not, no. I'm, you know, I, I don't really, we're, uh, I've been working with a lab in uh, in Montreal, Hans Larsen. Um, we also are working uh, with a, a woman in at Clemson University. Um, you know, we've got projects with various different people, but you know, and and it would to some degree it's good to have it all together. But on on the other hand, it's it's. I think better that everybody kind of be working separately. You know, I, I think, I don't think it's good to influence one another. I think it's just good to see what, what everyone can discover. And George is doing some great work. He's doing, you know, some fabulous stuff. And I really, you know, I can't wait to see what he produces. A woolly, but, a woolly mammoth by the sound. Of well, it. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> so how do, how do we look for these uh, atavistic genes. I'm probably saying that wrong, but, and also what would be the consequences? So theoretically, if we can do this with a chicken, I can turn the human into a Neanderthal or the dude before the Neanderthal or the dude before the dude before the Neanderthal. Cause that's way more recent. When does that stuff start to happen? Well, you know, first off atavistic, you know, the way you identify an atavistic gene is, you know, I, I'd say the best way is is just by, you know, identifying them in in mute in accidental mutations. Um, for instance, as as you probably know, um, children occasionally are born with extra vertebrae in a in their tail. Right, we have a tailbone, but occasionally there's some extra cartilaginous vertebrae and. And I understand doctors just sort of take that, take it off. Um, and that would be an atavistic gene. So, and every once in a while, snakes are born with legs and whales, uh, dolphins are, are born with extra flippers and stuff like that. That they're, These are ancestral genes that accidentally have, that have been turned off during the course of evolution, but accidentally get turned back, turned on. And 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 reveal, you know, these these ancestral characteristics. So, you know, when we can see them, we know that there that atavistic gene is is there. And all we have then then it's just a matter of you know going into the genome so you can find it. But but uh, we you know there's not very many other ways of figuring out what they might be. How do you I mean, hunt, how do you hunt for that stuff in the post Photoshop era where that's the best <laughs> way to get clicks? Dinosaur bored chicken. <laughs> well, you know it's you know the what what was your question? How do you <laughs> how do you distinguish the so so kind of what's happening is we're waiting until X, Y, Z completely unexpected event happens. We find that creature and then we're able to look at, okay, why is it that Matt has some type of tail coming out of his butt or whatever, whatever it ends up being. And then looking at my DNA to figure out what that is. Do you have to wait around to see those things to happen? And if you do, how in God's name do you actually find those things? We have a big world and our big world likes getting clicks and advertising dollars. Yeah, well, you know, it's, we are, you know, as far as the dino chicken goes, we're, we are, we are, you know, 
looking for particular ways to make an animal that looks like a dinosaur. So, so we're, you know, doing a, a lot of research just on the tail. And even in doing that, I mean, we we're, we've, we've made some really interesting discoveries about, um, the causes of, of some diseases that we have in humans. I mean, the cool thing is, is that as you do this research, as you look for these genes, you, you have the possibility of making a lot of other discoveries. And, and that's basically, you know, that, that's kind of the, the prize in all of this. Would I like to have a pet dinosaur? Absolutely. But, you know, there's a lot of other things coming out of this research that, that isn't obvious. Does it scare you at all that we find these genes that control X, but they also control Y and Z and Q and R too, and we don't realize it until we change things? Well, that's, that's, that's what we're trying to be cautious of right now. We don't know, you know, the, the Yale lab was able to alter the, the head. Um, Matthew Harris was able to get, uh, to initiate tooth growth. Um, we've figured out a way to you know, alter the hand. Is this um, all in vitro or in vivo? It's all it's all done within the embryo. We don't hatch anything. Um, so, you know, we're we have a lot of isolated research that's been done. We nobody's ever tried to put all of these different characteristics together yet to see if we could make it, you know, a different kind of animal. But that, you know, that would be the that would be something we would want to try later. When, once we have a tail, once we figure out the tail, who funds and the this? Tail is just you know, it's just it's complicated. It always is. That's always the, it's always the the eighty percent is the initial easy twenty step percent of the yeah. effort, and then vice versa, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. But it's you know, it's like I say, it it's producing an awful lot of. We're we're getting we're discovering a lot of things that we wouldn't have discovered otherwise. So. So it, you know, it's a, it's certainly a productive research avenue. How do mad scientists like you get funding to pretty much just have fun all day? <laughs> well, you know, I, we had an initial, uh, we had an initial donation, uh, and all of the funding for this project is donations. We have a GoFundMe site right now, where we're trying to get people to help out. Um, um, but that's, you know, we have, we have friends, donors, it's, it's not an expensive project. Uh, you know, we're right now we're looking for $300,000. We think is what it'll take to, I'll call up Spielberg. Get, you, I, yeah. I let you get the Velociraptors, <laughs> man. Just, just float me on this one and we'll, we'll call it even. <laughs> it's a. Uh, it's an incredibly fun thing. How do you think about it now that we're starting to do this with humans? Well, you know, that's again, that, that gets us into all, you know, into the politics and the religion, which I try to stay away from. So, you know, genetic modifications of humans. Um, I, I, I guess I, you know, I, I'm oftentimes on the wrong side of the fence there. Um, I, I'm not opposed to genetic modifications, especially if it's, if it, you know, it, I mean, we're obviously have the, are going to have the capability to solve a lot of genetic diseases. And I certainly don't have any problem with, with doing some genetic modifications that, that, you know, help people. On the other hand, you know, you could make an argument that, you know, if we solve all the diseases, we're just going to have too many people. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, there, you know, there's a lot of different different angles that you can take with this. But, but, uh, but I think, generally speaking, um, you know, just like anything else, genetic engineering um, can be 
used for good and it can be misused. It can be. I feel like in a lot of ways, what sci-fi tries to be is a reminder that the path to hell is paved in good intentions. Right. It's not exactly. always, and it's not always, but it helps you see. How do you think about, how do you think about sci-fi as a whole? We kind of talked about it a little bit earlier. Well, you know, it, it, that's, we use our imagination to make movies. We use our imagination in our books and, 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 and we can look back at a lot of, of sci-fi um, writers that had cool imaginations that that foresaw the fu- their future, right? And we see now that people can do a lot of the things that you know that were thought of as science fiction in the past. And obviously, a lot of things that were that people are writing about right now will become. Um, science reality in the future. Um, obviously, again, there's, you know, it's good that can come from it and there's bad that can come from it. What about that scares you? What, what about what? scares me? Nothing really. You know, I, I, I'm of the opinion that we, that science needs to discover everything that it can. And then it's up to politicians and whoever else to figure out whether we should. So you don't think there's any Pandora's box ever? I don't. I think we need, I, you know, I think science should be unlimited in our discoveries. And the, and the reason I say that, let me, let me just say, let me explain that because, you know, a lot of people have a real problem with me saying that, but the thing is, is that if we were to limit what we can do scientifically in our country, but they don't limit it in another country, then then we leave ourselves open to an awful lot of of potential. Um, let, let's just say, you know, we do we do re- we don't we don't do research on STEM. We, we stop stem cell research, right? So, but other countries are doing it and developing um, particular avenues using stem cells and, and their medical research just gets way, way ahead of ours. You know, is that, is that good? Is that good for us? I don't necessarily think it is, but, but that certainly is going to happen if we start limiting what we do scientifically and the same thing goes for you know i mean you can even think about it from biological warfare right i mean if scientists don't know what they can discover or what they can create if we don't know what we can create and we put a limit on it and some other country makes some kind of biological or chemical war warfare that we are not able to defend ourselves from because we put limitations on it, then we're in trouble. But attack and defense are different then because it's kind of, attack and defense are a little bit different though. So I think personally, well, but, you know, but from you know, different than what? So like when I, when I think about it, I would say there are some topics where uh, imagine, imagine you're in a race, you've got, you're driving your car and I'm driving mine and whichever one of us loses the race is going to get shot in the head. So in in that situation, you do whatever it takes to win. But right. what what if you could just both get out of the car and not drive? So sometimes I think there are these situations. So bi- bioterrorism, potentially one. Autonomous killing machines, definitely another. Where if you have something that gives so much power to a single individual, mm-hmm. enough power to wipe out everything or a massive something it's not as much like uh you don't have the balance of power of mutually assured destruction from nuclear bombs because then it just takes one crazy with a with a keyboard and you can find yourself in trouble Mm -hmm. it's a it's a hard quandary it is a hard quandary but but i think you know it's it's one of those things that would be good to try to defend against don't you think 
Oh, definitely to try to defend against. It'd be interesting if you could only research defense. I'm not sure entirely how that would be done. <laughs> but then, but then when it comes to other scientific, you know, um, you know, genetic engineering of humans. I mean, who gets to decide what you can do and what you can't do? It's, I mean, it's ultimately the black market because if you can't do it here, you go wherever the heck it's going to help your kids yeah. get ahead or wherever it's going to save right. them from X, Y, Z. It doesn't matter That's what right. a law, it doesn't matter about a law is if someone's going to die. Exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. Speaking of, do you think, do you, let's, let's go there. Do you think the U S will be leading in these in 20 years or do you think politics, um, religious pressures, et cetera, will lead to other countries? taking a lead, so to speak, and putting, putting us in the back burner. Well, I, I would say under our <clears throat> current, in our current situation, yes, I'd say we're going to be on the back burner. It would help him live in longer. He would certainly be a fan of that. In our, in our current situation. Yes. I'd say we're, we are, we are racing to the bottom. How do we turn that around? How do we change science in this country, especially? People like we, to say the U.S. is the best for education. It's just clearly not true. We go out and vote. Okay. If I give you a magic wand, how would you change the education system of today? Well, I would... Uh, I think the first... Yeah, First off, you have to define what the education system is. Are you talking about the K through 12 system? We'll talk about the K through PhD, whatever it ends up being. It could be we abolish it entirely and everyone gets to study dinosaurs or drawing or whatever it is that they most find passionate. If you got to redesign the way that we designed the way that kids are designed, what would you design? Well, I, if I, if, Let's get back to the whole education thing, you know, the K through 12, you know, who gets to decide what, what is put in textbooks in schools, for example. I'm, I, I don't know the answer to that exactly, but I'm pretty sure it's still um, based in Texas. Let's move that to California. Does it drive you nuts when people legitimately won't put evolution in textbooks? Of course. You know, I, you know, you know, it's just like gravity. It's going to happen whether you like it or not. But to teach people that to, to, you know, most, you know, the reason that most people don't like evolution is they don't understand it at all. Descent with modification simply means you're different than your parents. That's what evolution is. Evolution is the fact that you are different than your parents. The, the biggest change in all of evolution, the biggest change that ever occurs is the difference between your parents and your and their children. There's never a bigger change. Nobody, you know, fishes don't turn into dinosaurs. I mean, there's no there's never a point in time when a giant leap is made like that. It is always parent offspring that are the biggest changes. And those changes, we, we look at the accumulation of them over long periods of time. And then you can see, start looking, comparing the first to the last that you want to make the comparison with. You see how big of a change there is after you've looked at, at the accumulated changes after thousands of generations the biggest misunderstanding I see is people think it goes forwards when in reality it only makes sense looking backwards. It's not evolution selected for a better, it's not birds evolved a better bill to be able to pick this thing out of this little specific crack in this rock. It's the other ones that didn't get that weird random mutation died. So it just looks like it going well, in reverse. Let me, let me, let me just clear up one other thing, you know, <clears throat> we, we, we oftentimes say it's survival of the fittest and it's not survival of the fittest. It's survivor of survival of the survivor. Anybody can get hit by a bus, right? 
It's basically survivor of the luckiest. Survival of the luckiest. Because all kinds of things can happen. Do if we look at it generally, I guess you could say, you know, that they're, they're the fittest because they're the luckiest. Do you place any credence? And I've seen some alternative add-ons to Darwin's theory that appearance may play a bigger role in animals specifically where rape isn't the dominant form of procreation. Say, so I, I, you lost me there. What, what's the, so I, I don't remember the guy's name, but I'll, I'll have to look it up. Essentially he was looking at and analyzing different species of birds and you could find the birds that I, I this will sound crass, but the more or less what it came down to is the birds with external penises pretty much raped all the, female so it didn't really matter what in god's name they looked like and the ones that didn't have that had more longer term pair bonding and you could see with them there was a distinctly large difference between the color and attractiveness of the let's be friends versus let's go natural type approach so the the theory was in in cultures or in animals where rape wasn't the dominant form uh, because in the animal kingdom in general rape is a large portion of reproduction where rape wasn't the driving factor for reproduction then more power went in fact to the female so they got to decide and what were they going to decide on either strength power etc or well this is just more visually attractive and because i find this more visually attractive my daughters will find this more visually attractive it was an alternative theory that kind of added on to darwin's well um you know darwin had darwin published a, a lot of books and one of them was on one of them was called the descent of man the descent of man and in that he talks about sexual selection and sexual selection is when there is sexual dimorphism. So that's where the males look different than the females, right? And there's an obvious difference between them. So, so the antlers of, of deer, right? The males have it, the females don't. That is a clear example of sexual dimorphism. And therefore, we're looking at sexual selection, right? The females are are choosing the male, right, based on on his appearance, right? And and that is a clear example of of choosing, you know, choosing the male that appears to be the strongest, right? So we see, you know sexual dimorphism in a lot of birds. The male key peacock and the female peacock. I I don't I don't think there's you know I don't know how how you could define rape in birds necessarily because we don't really know what it is. I mean we you know we know that all animals use use various different ways of communicating sexually, right? So, so us us mammals are very good at communicating through pheromones. That's why you know mammals sniff one another. Uh, birds are very visual, right? So, a lot of a lot of of, of the, the signaling of birds is all is color, you know, it's all color based. Um, and so, you know, when we try to evaluate, um, evaluate the signaling or, or, you know, be homo, you know, homocentric and compare it with ourselves, then I, I guess you can use the word rape, but but in the animal world, in the animal kingdom, we have to sort of be cautious as to using that term because because 
we don't know the signals that the female is giving off when it's visual. Okay. I think, I think the big difference he was pointing to was the ones that had essentially an internal versus an external penis in terms of making it possible. But that's a, that's a whole nother story. We don't need to get into it right now. Yeah. Well, there's, there's, you know, there certainly are differences and, 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 and whether there's, whether there is in fact behavioral differences between them, that, that would be, that would be an, that is an interesting, you know, it's an, it would be an interesting subject. I would, I would like to see the data behind it though. I'll send you the podcast episode after this. So I have two, okay. I have two last questions for you, Jim. Right. The first one, make your pitch for paleontology. Why is this something that people should study? Why do kids need to get excited about this? Other than, of course, oh. freaking dinosaurs. Kids, kids are always interested in paleontology. We don't, I don't think we have to ad, advertise for them, but for the general public, you know, the history of our planet, Understanding the history of our planet, and and I don't mean just paleontology, I mean geological as well, is something that we should all be interested in because, because you know, the, the history of anything, the history of anything is always going to help us understand the future. I think that's a great explanation. I think it's a great truth that rings true and everything and now before you tell people where to find you if you had to leave people with one thing a quote a call to action something it can be anything what would it be and why (laughs) i would i i don't know that i have anything other than that i hope more females get interested in science and that dinosaurs had feathers and spielberg you were wrong and, yeah, I mean, you know, and I hope people help me out in my quest to make a dinosaur. You know, you just go on and on and on. <laughs> How long do you think until we until we birth a dino, the dino chicken? There's no way to know. You know, we've got to get the tail. The tail is what we're after right now. We get the tail, then it's just a matter of putting it all together. And so I, you know. Well, you will be I'd on the front cover three, of every say, magazine if you pull it I'd off. Say, I'd say we're $300,000 off right now. <laughs> $300,000 off. Somebody's got to be able to make that happen. Come on, guys. Let's yeah. let's get let's get a real Jurassic Park going, and then we can make a new movie. Thanks, uh, thanks for coming on today, Jack. This has been a lot of fun, especially for me. Where's the best place for people to learn more about you? I don't know. Wikipedia. <laughs> Bingo. Knows? I like it. Thanks. uh, Thanks for coming on. And thanks for tuning in, guys. Sweet. Cheers. Awesome. That was good. Okay.